ultra professional, um, uh, uh, sympathetic, and strong uh, producers that I ever encountered in anything, you know, uh, since. And he said, of course, he and Ridley had worked together for many years. And so they kind of knew each other's acts, if you like, and uh, they, were, they had this association at that time. And Ridley said, I'm not happy. And at that time, we were near the end of the film and money was running out. Fox wouldn't pay any more money into it. And um, Eva said, we've got to stop shooting Ridley. That's it. We've got to, we've got to have that shot. And Ridley went absolutely ape ballistic this was the one time i'd seen him and i think all the pressure <clears throat> had come out like and it's always the same with you know human nature you zero in on one thing and all the pressure comes out over that one you know in any relationship even or anything like that and you 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 say so this shot anyway he went absolutely crazy at the back of the uh rushes uh, uh theater and we were sitting down the front and no, no one dared turn around because it was like it, it was like they were married, like uh, and they were having an argument. It was like a, a domestic, but it, but it was a lot worse than that. And Eva was so icy calm, not 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 in a bad way, just keeping his level. Uh, and Rudy was uh, on his feet by this time, screaming and yelling, and uh, and he, and he said, "Evor, it's the opening shot in a." fucking special effects film and I want it right and Eva says we're out of time and, and he went on a bit more Ridley and Eva said to him one day Ridley someone is going to say no to you and Ridley says not me baby not fucking me anyway everyone got to their feet and we all filed out like at a funeral all looking the other way you know while they were here having it out and that showed that showed two things that showed how important the film was to Ridley and to everybody else to get it right and um, and the, the the sheer professionalism uh, and how lucky we were to have a guy like Ivor who was always behind the scenes working his working his magic and he had a great story sense he has a great story sense Ivor Powell too he writes you know screenplays and it was a real privilege and you never forget people like that I've, I've never forgotten Ivor Powell Do you like How I got involved in Alien was uh, by knowing Brian Johnson. I had been at uh, Kingston Polytechnic and I used the 16mm equipment uh, to actually shoot space stuff. And he said, I've been offered a deal, a two picture deal by Fox to do uh, the sequel to Star Wars, which was to become Empire Strikes Back, and a B movie a horror B-movie set in space called Alien. And he said, would you like to, you know, are you going to be available to work on these, to do miniatures? And uh, it didn't take, you know, too much of a, there wasn't much of a hesitation. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'd love to do it. And he said, well, we've got to do the B-movie first of all. And uh, as it turns out, I only worked on the B movie, but uh, I'm not complaining. I was one of the first on Alien uh, because it was B movie and therefore low budget. Uh, it was a very small crew to start off with. I, uh, when I went to Bray, there was uh, Ron Hone was there, and later on through. A, a suggestion of uh, Dennis Lowe, uh, Simon Deering came on board. It, so there were the three of us doing the, the miniatures. Ridley would show up uh, uh, just occasionally to, to see what was going on. Uh, he had his plate full over here, uh, Shepperton Studios, which is where the main unit was done. Uh, so the first the first stuff that we got was actually Ridley storyboards 
uh, I mean, I I knew who Ridley was. I've always been a bit of a filmophile, so I had seen the Duelists and thought it was a great piece of work. Everybody else on the film said, "Oh, it's the guy who did the Hovisides. Is directing this picture, so God help us." Last stop on round would be old Ma Peggotty's place. Twas like taking bread to the top of the world. Twas a grand ride back though. I knew Baker at Afkettle on it. Doorsteps of our always ready. There's wheat germ in that loaf, he'd say. Get it inside your boy, and you'll be going up that hill as fast as you come down. Well, this still has many times more wheat germ than ordinary bread. It's as good for you today as it's always been. And even when, you know, you uh, on the, the, the shoot, you get some of the guys in the background whistling the Hovis theme. Um, I don't know what Ridley thought about that, but I'd always had a tremendous amount of time for him. I, I knew that he had been an art director at the BBC. I, and also it was rumoured that when he came on board Alien, he had directed over a thousand commercials at that time. So the guy knew what he was doing. There was <laughs> Of that there was no doubt. And also, he was, he was a damn fine artist. So the storyboards were our starting point. Brian gave us the relevant frames of the, the Nostromo lander and refinery. Uh, in Ridley's storyboards, they were very gothic in style. And the first job we had to do was um, a tower for the refinery. Uh, from Ridley's black and white board, we made one tower, one prototype tower. That was Simon Deering and myself put that together. It was, as I say, very, very gothic. Uh, you could, I was trying to mimic what Ridley had drawn, so it was very transparent. Uh, there was a lot of lattice work in it, platforms. Uh, so, you know, we, we kit bashed it mainly. And Nicky Alder did some test, uh, some actual test uh, footage of it. Uh, I believe Ridley had said that he wanted uh, to see how the towers would look painted black. So Ridley, uh, uh, sorry, Nicky lit them and shot them uh, black. And uh, he, uh, he lit them in various ways and some of the shots they look silver so you know he proved a point that they didn't have to be black uh, you could make black look like silver or silver look like black so uh, but that that tower is actually on the Nostromo refinery it seemed to be one of Ridley's favorites after all that time if you watch the film very closely you'll find that the towers do move round quite a bit. They're not always in the same place. Because Ridley would say, Oh, get us that tower, put it over into this corner, I'm, I'm over here shooting. So, he did have his favourite pieces of wiggetry. Yeah. There were only the three of us doing the, the preparatory miniatures. Uh, Simon, myself, doing the tower, uh, Ron Hohen started work on the Nostromo lander. A, a few drawings came over from Ron Cobb. It's, uh, I, I can't remember when Ron Cobb came on board and when we started seeing his stuff. But we had three quarter views of the Nostromo on the surface of the planet. So, see, I, I remember about three of them. I believe the first one was white. Uh, and it was it was quite NASA looking, and that was the one that we Ron made, uh, the first prototype. Uh, Ron uh, was trained as a pattern maker, and to be honest, uh, 
he wasn't too sure of working with just one view, a three-quarter view. So Brian realised this and said, Bill, can you work with Ron? And, you know, I I could work in plastics, but, you know, I had no idea with wood. And Ron was going to make this in a Malaysian wood, gel Utah. And you've got to be good <laughs> with tools in order to do this. For God's sake, I was, you know... I'd, I uh, bumbled away with plastic kits at college and I couldn't use a lathe, nothing. Um, so Rowan got me some balsa wood and a couple of craft blades. It was, it was that bad. And uh, we didn't even get any balsa cement. So I made up this model. It was probably about at most maybe 16 inches long and uh, pinned it together with dressmaking pins. Brian came in, had a look at it and said, that's the shape, that is it. So Ron then proceeded to make my, uh, my abortion out of real wood. And uh, once that was complete, Brian said, right, totally encrusted it with wiggets. So it was a lot of Airfix kits the finest bits from HMS Hood and uh, a lot of plastic art cut into little squares and applied onto the gel Utah model uh, with a, a glue that had just appeared on the market, super glue. Uh, and super glue at that time was incredibly strong, much stronger than what it is now. So I was constantly sticking myself to other tools and parts of the workbench. But we put the whole thing together uh, and Brian said, right, paint it. And it seemed to be according to one of Ron Cobb's drawings that had gone down well, it was going to be yellow. So it was a, a can of uh, something like Signal Yellow uh, from Halfords and uh, sprayed it up and then picked some bits out in slightly uh, different uh, shades of that yellow. And matted the whole thing down with letter set 103 matte fixative. And that was it, that, that did the rounds in, that was the discussion model. And it changed, even now I'm not sure, I, th I think it went to white, then grey, then an off-white. Um, and each time it changed colour, it was a case of starting back and shooting from day one again. So uh, for the film, it, it's still the longest I've ever been on a movie. Uh, I was one of the first on and I was one of the last off. Uh, and I was there in entirety for uh, one year and two days. At the end, I was asked to stay on Peter Beale, who was the head of Fox in Europe, uh, who I had met a few times on the production, asked me if I would remain at Bray at the end and refurbish the models because they were all going over to a, a screening in the States and they wanted uh, the, uh, the Nostromo refinery, uh, the uh, Narcissus, and I think it, it was, yeah, and the, the large Nostromo, uh, they all had to be refurbished to go over there. So I, I had a, a couple of weeks. The refinery was in a hell of a state. And I never really liked a lot of the dressing on it, uh, mostly my own. Um, my own biggest critic so when I got the opportunity to redress and money at that point was no object I just bought loads in and put all the sort of dressing in that I wanted in the first place when we had like three and sixpence to do everything uh, so it the the model refinery that went over to the States was not accurate to the one in the movie whatsoever. It was a lot better looking, I thought. 
it was a learning curve for me. And at the end, going to the cruise screening in Leicester Square, I was very disappointed. But the reason for that disappointment was I didn't know how film really worked. Uh, I expected every detail that I put into the movie to be up there on screen. And uh, that's where the disappointment sprang from. Uh, I loved the rest of the film, but I was disappointed by my input on screen. Uh, as the years have passed, I've learned that I was damn lucky that, you know, so much of my work did make it up there. Uh, but I've always been very proud of my involvement in the film. But I think the film was a success, not so much because of my involvement, maybe, maybe in spite of. Uh, but at the end, I, I believed I did is as good a job as I could at the time. Drop me off.